the stories in the picture. Uh, this is way up north on a road that uh, I guess some vehicles can drive across because it's frozen. This one couldn't. And uh, it, it made a bad decision and ended up in a, you know, in a bad way. I, I'm hoping the driver was able to get out through his window. It looks like he probably did, but it was cold as a result and lots of damage. Can I get this turned off, this one? Uh, hopefully you can see by the picture here, the gentleman's looking up at the sign that has the height restrictions of the bridge. And uh, I don't know if that's the driver or a bystander, but somebody's recognizing that uh, a driver went down a road and under a bridge he probably shouldn't have had he been paying attention. Maybe she been paying attention, I don't know. Probably he though. We're more distracted. And here's a, uh, a wonderful driver from Walmart who uh, also made a bad decision. That bridge is nowhere near tall enough for the truck to go underneath. Usually bridges like that, I think almost all of them have a sign leading up to it, letting you know the height of the bridge you're coming up to. And every driver should know the restrictions that their vehicle, their weight, the height, so on and so forth. This brings me to my own, not bad experience, but my own experience of driving large vehicles. I took a trip to Texas with the school last year, and on that trip to Texas, my, the majority of my driving was done in a bus that was also pulling a trailer. We do that every once in a while, and the bus that I was driving, the one with the hitch on it, is longer than the other bus already. Then you attach another white long trailer on the back of it, and it gets to be uh, quite the, the, the long thing for somebody who doesn't do this on a, you know, everyday basis. And I was going into uncharted territory for me. Um, Texas is not my uh, area of visiting. I haven't been there very often and was going to some larger places in Texas and we're going to schools that we're supposed to go to and there's gymnastics mats in the back so I can't park, you know, half a mile away or a mile and walk there. We, we have to get close. And some of these Adventist schools, you know, they're small and their parking lots aren't large. And I've got to think about, okay, as I'm coming up to it, do I go into that parking lot? Will I be able to get out of it? The bus, you can do like a 30-point turn and make it out maybe. But with the trailer on it, it's a whole different ball game. And so you're really trying to calculate it out. You're getting, uh, you're looking at a satellite. Sometimes I get on my map and look at the school and the satellite picture before we get there and see how big's the parking lot. Does it look like I could possibly get in there? Hopefully there won't be any cars in it. All those kinds of questions. And then when we get there, we're, we're talking to other faculty saying, go out and check. They're looking and, you know, I'm getting advice from people and some of the locals, they'll say, oh yeah, you can pull in there and you can turn around because they're familiar with the area and I'm not. And I take their advice. I remember one school, we went into the parking lot and the cars just started to come in. I'm like, how am I going to get out of this thing? I've got a trailer behind me. I've got to pull around. And he's like, oh, you can go over here and turn around. I wouldn't have known that, but he did. So you have to start pulling in information from all over the place to uh, make a good decision. Because if you make a quick decision or a hasty decision, you can end up like these poor truck drivers with a devastating result. Now, I'm in trouble this morning. Trouble because I looked up there. If you want to look up there at that wall, you'll see why I'm in trouble. Do you notice it too? There's no clock. I mean, there's a clock, but the clock is not right. And uh, that. It's a good reminder we need to change the battery in the clock, apparently. Uh, it doesn't help us this morning because if I look at my watch, you can look at your watches, and that's great. You know what time it is, but it's kind of awkward for you to yell it out to me. And maybe or maybe not, if I'm in the middle of something, I may or may not look down at my watch because I am wearing one. Uh, so I have no idea when we're going to get out today. Um, that could be good for you. It could be bad. It looks like they're going to try to fix it. That would be fantastic. Not that we have to get out the stroke of 12, but you know, it's nice to be in the ballpark. So, if they can get that fixed, then uh, it will be good for all of us. That's the, all the images I have to show you, so I'm going to turn this off.
and move over to my notes. Now the other uh, issue is I'm not uh, a preacher, I'm a teacher by trade. And have uh, you ever been in a class when the teacher finishes right before, the, like they say, say the word and then the bell rings? Like how do they do that? How do they do it? And usually, for me anyway, it was just luck. It never was totally planned, it, it just happened. Because I was never watching my, looking at my watch. I'm usually irritated when it rings before I'm done. But, uh, I don't know how long my notes are going to take to, to say. So it could be short, it could be long. It is what it is. And we'll just go with it. Today I'm going to be asking a lot of questions, though. And teachers ask questions. Good teachers ask questions. Some students would say good teachers give answers. And that's not true. Good teachers ask questions and direct the students of where to find the answer. That's what a good teacher does. Because if all we're doing is giving the answers, then nobody's thinking. So today I might ask some questions and not deliver the answer as well. But I may lead you, hopefully, to a source where you could find the answer. And at least in your mind, the Lord can speak to you and deliver an answer, because I think a lot of the questions have obvious answers. It just happens that we don't always ask them. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, as we uh, get into this message today, I pray that your spirit would be among us, that you can give clarity to my words and the thoughts, keep it organized so that uh, it makes sense. Lord, it's uh, a most important topic that I pray each one would find benefit from. Thank you, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Wouldn't it be great if all the decisions we made in life we made as carefully as those truck drivers should have and as carefully as, as I do when I'm driving a bus. I'm a lot more cautious when I'm driving a bus than when I'm driving my truck. Because my truck, I can stop, put it in reverse, back up, no big deal. If I get in here tight, there's no parking lot too tight for my truck, really. Um, but the bus, totally. If I was to think ahead for every decision I made, just like I do when I'm driving the bus. Maybe if I consulted other people before making some of the decisions I make in life, wouldn't I avoid a lot of pain, a lot of heartache, a lot of mistakes, a lot of damage to others and to myself? How about you? How many bad decisions could we avoid? What kind of a positive influence could we become if we were to think out our choices? You know, when you come to a fork in the road, you have two options. Two options in a fork, in the road anyway. Dinner fork has more options, but two options in a fork in the road. And maybe both of them are good. Maybe both of them are bad. You hope there's at least one good option out of those two. If they're both bad, you've made a wrong turn somewhere back before. But with a fork in the road in life, there's two, two paths, two options. And I'm not talking about big forks. Who am I going to marry? Uh, what job am I going to have? Uh, I'm not talking about those things. Those are very important decisions. And those are ones we find ourselves seeking the Lord's counsel on often. If we're Christians, that's kind of typical to direct our prayers to the Lord. Lord, is this the right person for me to spend the rest of my life with? Lord, should I pursue this career or should I pursue that one? Lord, should I move or should I not move? What should I? Those big decisions, those are easier to take to the Lord. Not always easy to listen to what the Lord says, but they're at least easy to present to him. And those are not the decisions I want to talk about today, although you should take those decisions. Those are kind of big forks that are, are important, kind of shape the rest of your trip. I'm talking about the insignificant things. I'm going to put quote marks around insignificant because I don't know how insignificant they are. Proverbs, the 12th chapter and the 15th verse says, The way of a fool 
is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. He who heeds counsel is wise. Have you ever asked God for advice, but not waited for his answer? The big decisions, yes. Sometimes even the small ones. We can throw up a quick prayer, and boom, we're doing what we thought we were going to do from the beginning. We ignored, we didn't even wait for, to give him a chance to respond. It would be my wife asking me, should I wear this dress or this dress? And then she starts putting on the other one anyway before I even can speak back. You know, that wouldn't, be, that wouldn't make much sense for her to ask if she's not going to wait for a response. We do this often with God. Sometimes we become frustrated because the answer didn't coincide with what we really wished for to begin with. Philippians 4.6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. It doesn't say the big things. It says in everything, and that's really what I want to address today. What are the insignificant decisions in your life that affect its ultimate outcome? I'm going to read you off a list of some I just thought of. Of course, there's a million more. Should I talk about this person behind their back? Is this a movie or a television show I should watch? Should I hang out with these friends? Should I linger with this person I'm not married to? Should I respect my parents' wishes? Should I report this income on my taxes? Should I wander around on the internet when no one is around? Should I have this drink? Should I engage in this common secular activity on the Sabbath day? These are smaller forks in your road. They're smaller in that they happen a lot. You're encountered with um, choices daily. Maybe not each one of those, but you, you probably have found yourself encountered with similar things each and every day of your life. You're encountered with decisions that you have to make. They're not what, in your mind, you think of as big. Who am I going to marry? What kind of job should I take, you know, pursue? Should I change careers, should I have another baby or not, those kinds of, those are big. These are things that you deal with each and every day. And so often, we, like these truck drivers, blaze ahead and don't ask for counsel, for wise counsel, on how to meet them. What if Eve had sought the counsel of God or from Adam before making her insignificant decision Think what might have been avoided had she done that. What do you think God would have told her? What do you think Adam would have told her if she'd have asked before she ate? Why didn't Abraham ask the angel who had told him about the promise of a son coming, about Sarah's plan or her idea for them having the son, even though God hadn't provided it yet? What do you think the angel would have told Abraham had he stopped and asked counsel? How about if Aaron had asked counsel before giving in to the people's wishes for a golden calf? There's people that died as a result of that incident, quite a few of them. What if David had inquired of the Lord if he should invite Bathsheba up for a visit? These are the kinds of forks in the road that we encounter and I'm not saying that we ask for the decision. I think Satan puts those forks in our path. And he makes one of the roads a lot more attractive than the other road. So that we choose the one that is easier. With every temptation, we meet a fork in the road. One path leads to destruction. The other leads to life everlasting. Why do we find it so easy to end up on the path to destruction? The Bible says destruction's way is broad and its gate is wide, and many people find it. While the way to life is narrow and straight, and few find it. 
even though God promises a way of escape for every temptation, the way seems to escape us. What is that way? I've, that's my favorite verse in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It's, it's my favorite because it gives hope to me who often feels hopeless. It lets me know that Satan is less powerful than God because there's nothing that Satan can throw at me that God has not provided a way of escape. But even though that is my favorite verse, I often wonder, Lord, what is the way of escape? And why isn't it more obvious to me so I choose it? Why am I continually ignoring the way of escape or not thinking there is one and I head down the path that destroys? Somehow it's got to become and then I start questioning myself and saying, well, maybe it's me. Maybe it's my own insincerity. Maybe it's just I want to go down that path so bad I'm ignoring the road signs, just like our gentleman who did all that damage. He followed his satellite navigations. It was telling him where to go. He ignored the obvious road sign. Maybe that's it. Maybe I'm just ignoring the road signs. I would turn you to James chapter 1 and verse 5. James chapter 1 and verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Well, I find myself oftentimes lacking wisdom because I find myself making the wrong choice more often than I wished. And I chalk that up to my lack of wisdom my lack of knowledge. I don't think that gentleman there would have taken the turns he took had somebody been sitting next to him in the truck saying, hey, by the way, where you're headed is way too tight for this truck. It will not make it. Had he asked, he would have found out. He chose to go with his own wisdom, what the satellite navigation was telling him. That seemed to be his best option. I am convinced that the way of escape provided for from these temptations is to seek counsel from God and from the godly people he has placed in our lives. That, I think, is where I have failed. And many of you fail each day. When you come to the fork in the road, oftentimes we rely on our own judgment to determine which is the right way. And we don't even stop long enough to ask counsel from anybody else or God himself. You know, the Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. Maybe it means for these situations. Ask me each step of the way. When you come to that fork, ask me. I will tell you the right way to go if you just stop and ask me. Counsel from God is good as long as we are open to hearing his answer. If we go into the decision already determined where we want to go, we're not going to listen even if we did bother to ask because we don't want to hear what he has to say. And often I think that's why we don't ask. We know what he's going to say and we don't want him to tell us. If, he does, if, we, don't, if we don't verbalize it, then maybe we don't have to follow it. Ask forgiveness, not permission, right? It's the rule. That's how it should be. Right, students? Ask, ask forgiveness, not permission. And we always tell you the opposite. No, ask permission, not forgiveness. That's what God wants us to do as well. Ask his permission before we do anything. Now, I said before that I believe that our way of escape is to seek the counsel from God and from godly people he has placed in our lives. But do you know that Satan has been masterful at making that second option incredibly difficult to do? Asking godly people that, that have been placed in our lives advice when we come to forks in the road? Do you know how embarrassing it is to ask somebody a question like that about some of those topics I've mentioned before or other ones like it? The vices that seem to weigh us down 
that, that we're addicted to, that we're caught up in, that we can't seem to shake? Do you know how awkward it is to ask somebody advice on something like that? Satan has convinced us that everyone will look down on us, that we will be shamed, and our pride cannot allow us to admit our shortcomings. If hospitals only treated the wounds you could see, think of all the people who would die from injuries on the inside. They are often the most serious injuries because they go unnoticed and untreated. We can generally admit we're all sinners, right? It's very hard to share with somebody personally the struggles you actually have because you feel maybe they'll think you are less of a Christian, that you are further away from God. And we don't really want to give that perception. We want people to look up to us. It's part of our natural pride. Satan has successfully manipulated many in the church to become those where people are ashamed of their shortcomings. They keep to themselves. This is not what Christ had in mind. Galatians 6, chap, excuse me, chapter 6, verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. He, he's not just talking about a trespass that's obvious, that's on the surface. He's talking about trespasses that are on the inside. And those that are spiritual among you need to lift them up in a spirit of what? Gentleness, not condemnation. Gentleness. We have to feel open enough to share so that somebody can help. We have to feel safe enough to ask advice without feeling condemned. This church, God's church, could be a much more loving, encouraging atmosphere for those that are struggling. What a healthy place it would be if men and women felt comfortable allowing others to not only see their shortcomings, but also allow them to restore them in a spirit of gentleness. You see, I believe Satan wants us to meet him alone, by ourselves, in the privacy of our minds. It is there that he is the most successful. It is there he convinces us that we have already messed up and we might as well give up and give in. It is there he convinces us that this little sin won't really hurt anyone. It is there he appeals to our love of excitement. It is in our minds that he leads us past our better judgment and encourages sinful impulse. Alone just he and us, excluding God and excluding those around us. Isaiah 30, verses 1 and 2 says, Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel, but not of me, and who devise plans, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who walk down, who walk to go down to Egypt and have not asked my advice. He's talking about those that blaze their own trail, that choose their own fork without any counsel whatsoever. Not only do they reject his counsel, they also reject the counsel of the godly people that, God has, that he has placed in their life. We all desire, we desire to submit to God, to resist the devil so that he will flee from us. Is that not our desire as Christians? I think most people that are struggling with sin desire it to be gone from them. Most are not looking for the next opportunity to stumble. Most feel so bad about when they do stumble that they just are sickened. But Satan gets them alone and then they fall again. We want to submit to God to resist the devil so he will flee from us, but we don't know how. I'm going to read you something, 
and it's a little long. I'll try to go slow so you don't totally disconnect, okay? This is one of the most powerful things that I have ever read. Uh, and it is my favorite thing I've read from the Spirit of Prophecy. Just like 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is my favorite verse in the Bible because it speaks to a sinner and gives him hope. This passage gives me hope above all others. And it is from the book Steps to Christ, chapter 5, entitled Consecration. Many are inquiring, how am I to make the surrender of myself to God? You desire to give yourself to him, but you are weak in moral power, in slavery to doubt, and controlled by the habits of your life of sin. Your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. You cannot control your thoughts, your impulses, and your affections. The knowledge of your broken promises and forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own sincerity and causes you to feel that God cannot accept you. I'm not done. I'm just going to pause here a second. That is the condition in which Satan wants you to dwell. You, you give up asking because you feel you've asked so many times that your promises to God, your, your uh, commitments that you made to him, are meaningless. They're like ropes of sand. They, they, won't, they won't hold any weight. And so you stop trying. You give up. God can't accept you like this. Why, why is he going to listen to you again when you repent, when you ask forgiveness? Why is he going to listen to you? You're just going to do it right over again. Next week. Maybe you'll last a month, but you're going to fall right back into the same habits that you were in before. He gets people there, and he wants to talk to you alone. Just you and him. Satan and you, by yourself, keeping everybody else at a distance so nobody knows what you're struggling with. Keep it under control. If you can put on a good front, nobody will know the pain that's really going on inside. And then... Nobody can give you advice. And then you'll feel that God doesn't want to give you advice. This is Satan's plan that she's talking about in here. There's good news. She says, but you need not despair. Oh, here's the, here's the good. What you need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision, the power of choice. Everything depends on the right action of the will. That's your choices. Everything depends on your choices. There's a, I'm not going to get too sidetracked here, but there's a theology that says Jesus takes care of everything you have nothing to do Jesus did pay the sacrifice completely independent of you but you still have to choose him it still results in your choice doesn't mean your choice has anything to do with somebody else's salvation necessarily but it has everything to do with your own because he does not force himself on you he doesn't force salvation on you he lets you choose it. The power of choice God has given to men, it is theirs to exercise. You cannot change your heart. That's good news. You cannot change your heart. You cannot, of yourself, give to God its affections. You can't even make your heart want something different. but you can choose to serve him. You can give him your will. He will then work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Thus your whole nature will be brought under the control of the Spirit of Christ. 
Your affections will be centered upon him. Your thoughts will be in harmony with him. Oh, that our thoughts were in harmony with the Lord. What a wonderful day that would be. Think of the weight lifted from your shoulders when your heart, excuse me, when your thoughts were pure. Desires for goodness and holiness are right as far as they go. But if you stop here, they will avail at nothing. Many will be lost while hoping and desiring to be Christians. That's a scary thought. They do not come to the point of yielding their will or their choices to God. They don't ask his advice. They don't seek his counsel. They don't follow his directions. They do not now choose to be Christians. Through the right exercise of the will, an entire change may be made in your life. By yielding up your will to Christ, you ally yourself with the power that is above all principalities and powers. You will have strength from above to hold you steadfast. And thus, through constant surrender to God, you will be enabled to live the new life, even the life of faith. You've heard people talk about needing to, the, the importance of having morning devotions, of spending some time with God in the morning. Do you realize that the purpose of that is not so you you do your 20, 30 minutes, an hour, or whatever. It's kind of like penance where you just have to spend that time and, okay, I've paid my dues today. I'm right with the Lord. That's not the purpose whatsoever. The purpose is that day to consecrate yourself to him and to ask his help for each fork that you're going to encounter throughout the day. And as you go throughout the day, you don't rely on the fact that you asked them in the past. If I told somebody, hey, I'm going on this trip. I know you've been there before. I'm going to call you when I get to some turns that I'm not sure of. You tell them that at the beginning of the trip. Then you head out on the trip. You never call them. What good did that do? It doesn't do any good. It's great to tell them, can you be available so I can call you? That's really what you're doing to the Lord in the morning. When when you've got your Bible open, you're probably not assailed with a ton of temptations at that point. You've got them right there present with you. You're probably going to go down the right fork. It's later when you shut your Bible, you go throughout your day, and you get busy, and you forget about him. You don't even think about him anymore. That's when Satan comes with a new fork, a new direction. And then you're encouraged to say, I forgot about God entirely, and I don't want to ask anybody else around me because I don't want them to understand what I'm struggling with, so I'll just keep it to myself, and I'll figure it out on my own, and I, I made the wrong decision then you feel guilty all over. Former President Ronald Reagan once had an aunt who took him to a cobbler for a new pair of shoes. The cobbler asked young Reagan, do you want square toes or round ones? Unable to decide, Reagan didn't answer. So the cobbler gave him a few days. Several days later, the cobbler saw Reagan on the street and asked him again, what kind of toes he wanted in his shoes. Reagan still couldn't decide. So the shoemaker replied, well, come by in a couple of days, your shoes will be ready. When the future president did so, he found one square-toed and one round-toed shoe. The cobbler said, this will teach you to never let people make decisions for you. Reagan said, I learned right then and there, if you don't make your own decisions, someone else will. The Lord says, choose you this day whom you will serve. And I encourage you, as the forks come, not only if you're asking for help, but if you're someone that help is asked of, we need to create a spirit that is safe to help one another. No sin is greater than another. No sin is more uh, damaging, ultimately, than another. They all have the same outcome. And all of us have need of help from God and from our Christian brothers and sisters. If we had the environment where we would lift one another up and be there throughout the day to help. Think about how many disasters would be avoided. 
Think about how much good would be done. Think about what this church could accomplish. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, this message in preparing it has reminded me each day as I go through my day decisions I make that previously I didn't consult you on. I'm starting to think, starting to contemplate what would Jesus have me do in this situation? I'm asking your opinion. And you're delivering answers as you've promised. You told us that if we seek you for wisdom, you will give it to us. Lord, I pray that each one here, through contemplating their own lives, they know their own struggles. That they would be reminded also when faced with a difficult situation, a difficult decision, or what they may feel is an insignificant decision, that they would seek counsel from you and from the godly people in their lives. We all want to be together with you in the kingdom. We all want to choose this day to serve you. As he sings in Jesus' name, amen. Would the, those leading the song come up? Your closing song is number 554. Number 554. The title is, Oh, Let Me Walk With Thee. And as you're singing it, pay attention to the words and realize that if we have Christ walking with us, with us throughout the day, he's there and available to ask for advice. I just want to remind you that it is uh, fellowship lunch today. Even if you didn't bring something, the Lord has a way of providing plenty of food. It would be wonderful to have you stay in fellowship. Get to know some of the people that uh, can lift you up as brothers and sisters in Christ. So if you weren't planning on it and you're able, please stay by for the fellowship lunch. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, you've given us a, a message this morning. You've given us a song the words of that song, we have you willing to walk hand in hand with us throughout the day, no matter what 
the tempests that come, no matter what the decisions Satan wants to bring and try to draw us off the path that you would have us on. You promise to walk hand in hand with us, to be there, to put people in our path as well that will lift us up in a spirit of gentleness. As we leave this place, let us not lose the desire to have you there by our side. Send your spirit to go with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.